With great power comes great responsibility. Compromise where you can. Where you can't, don't. Even if everyone is telling you that something wrong is something right. Even if the whole world is telling you to move. It is your duty to plant yourself like a tree. Look them in the eye and say no. You move. Never step onto the battlefield of ideas unprepared. Before you enter the fray, you need a plan. And there's no better place to get one than right here on Tactics with host Caleb Colquitt. The Situation Room goes live now on News Radio 1440. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Tactics, where speech isn't violence, tolerance isn't love, and disagreement isn't hate. Thank you so much for joining us, whether you're joining us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, whatever platform you're on. We are glad that you are here with us tonight. And as you can tell, we're not in our normal studio. Uh, we are here at the Wetumpka Tea Party Candidates Forum with the Secretary of State himself, Mr. John Merrill. Welcome to the program. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me as your guest. Yeah, well, thank you so much for coming on. And I know that you're actually not running for anything That's anymore. That's correct. Um, which, great to to my disappointment, you dropped out of the, uh, the Senate race which I understand why. I right, got your reasoning, right. but, uh, I mean, I was going to vote for you. Well, you're kind to say that. We were excited about the campaign, and we had a lot of field support. We had chairs in all 67 counties. Yeah. Our fundraising equal to or surpassed everybody in the race from the day we got in the race until the day that we withdrew and suspended our campaign on December 1st. But when Senator Sessions decided to run again, it changed the dynamics of the race dramatically. Oh, drastically. And we just felt like it was in our best interest and the best interest of the party not to continue to pursue the nomination. Well, I definitely understand that. And like I said, I, I was disappointed, but I, I get why you did it. But that's really not why we're here tonight. We're here to talk about really the election process. Absolutely. And, you know, that's something that has been, and I think in some ways it's even good that our election process has come under more scrutiny in the past couple of years. We, we have to worry about, you know, Russian bots hacking in sure. and, and all these other things, which to a degree, I like the fact that people seem more aware, they're more interested in it, they, they want to make sure that everything is done correctly, there's not like a blind trust there. So um, in some ways it's good, in some ways it's bad, people kind of doubt the results of elections. Well, sure, and the most important and thing to yeah, us is that that's each what I was gonna ask every about, yeah. individual that cast a ballot for the candidate of their choice mm -hmm. needs to know that that ballot has been properly identified and counted and recorded for the candidate of their choice. That's all anybody wants to know when it comes to the elections process. We can assure the voters of Alabama in all 67 counties and all 2,499 polling sites that when they cast their candidate's ballot, for that person, mm -hmm. it's going to be counted for that person. Well, you know, there's a, a famous quote by Thurgood Marshall where he talked about when we're setting laws, we always have to think about things from the, the mind of the nefarious or the evildoer. And so I was really wondering, like, if we're thinking at it from that perspective, let's say that you were somebody that wanted to affect the vote, that wanted to cheat. What is your department doing to stop somebody like that? Is, is that something that runs through your mind? Like, how well, of hard would it, it be to hack into Absolutely, and it's extraordinarily difficult to break into our election system right. because our system is not connected through the Internet at any point whatsoever. And because of that, it would be difficult for them to gain access to try to manipulate the results. Mm -hmm. Tabulation changes cannot occur because of that. And as far as the hardware is concerned, right. it's difficult for anybody to gain access to it when it's kept under lock and key by the sheriffs or the local election officials until the day of the vote being cast. So sort of the idea that somebody from, I don't know, Siberia is in his computer and, and just working from there to somehow hack into Alabama's elections, that's not even not going to work out because there's no way they can gain access to the system. I would say this. The thing that we saw in 2016 right. that was Russian hacking was in social media. Right. What we saw in Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, other social media accounts where those that wish to do us ill or harm, international and domestic actors, were actually interfering with our understanding of the election process because of how they were trying to engage and getting our people to engage in that interaction. Now, there were attempted hacks, for example, in the state of Indiana, 
but not a single one was actually successful that is by correct. foreign agents. No tabulation changes occurred in any one of the polling sites in any state in the union in 2016, nor since that time. Now, I kind of want to pick your brain here and ask you about this, because this was something that I made this argument on the air over and over again. A lot of people, you hear a lot of talk now about getting rid of the Electoral College. Right. But what a lot of the people don't understand is the Electoral College actually makes it much, much more difficult for people to hack into our election because not only would they have 50 different states they have to hack into 50 different systems, they also have to know which states they have to hack into to be able to affect the vote, and That's correct. you can't know that ahead of time. That is correct, and things are subject to change, as we saw in 2016 right. and in 2000 when we had George Walker Bush elected, and they called Florida five times before they actually ended the election. Mm -hmm. And, and that's one thing that I, you know, feel a lot better about with the Electoral College is that, um, you know, nobody would have guessed that to help President Trump win, you have to ha hack into Wisconsin. Like <laughs> that would have never entered anybody's mind because they thought it was a safe blue state. And it's also important to remember that right. five times in the history of the republic mm -hmm. has a candidate been elected by the Electoral College that did not receive the most votes in the popular vote in the election. Right. One of those, of course, being Abraham Lincoln. Well, kind of. I know kind of. Yeah, because he didn't receive a majority. But those people were uh, Andrew Jackson receiving the most and John Quincy Adams being elected president. Mm -hmm. uh, Samuel Tilden receiving the most votes, but Rutherford B. Hayes being elected president. And then Benjamin Harrison being elected by the Electoral College, but right. defeated by Grover Cleveland all three times by the popular vote. And then in... 2000, uh, George Walker Bush, and in 2016, President Trump. So those are the five times in the history of the republic. What, what I was talking about, though, is that uh, President Lincoln did not receive the majority of the national That's vote correct. Because he had a three-way race. That's correct. But anyway, sorry, I got, no, got a little okay. confused on the word. That's okay. But, you know, I, I geek out about this stuff just like I'm, I'm sure that you do as well. Um, so... When it comes to the Alabama election, uh, what has your department done since your tenure as, as Secretary of State to sort of make sure that our elections are fair and everybody, one person, one vote? Well, one thing is we have to make sure that our election officials in each county, all the probate judges, all 68 probate judges in the 67 counties, are properly trained, okay. and then they train their local field workers in the 2,499 polling sites. So they're prepared to execute the election the way that it needs to be executed each and every time we have an election. The other thing that's important to know is in order for you to vote, you have to be a registered voter. Since January the 19th, 2015, we've registered 1,422,600 and 61 new voters and now have a state record 3,520,000, I'm sorry, 3,556,832 registered voters as of today. So you got to be registered to participate in the process and you have until February the 14th to do it by mail or February the 17th to do it electronically. All right, so, so let's say I'm the average listener out there. I've never registered to vote, maybe just now getting into politics. Uh, who, who would I look for? What are the steps to go through Great that registration question. process? And if they have a driver's license, they can download the mobile application for their phone at Vote for Alabama okay. and then register to vote on their phone because the valid Alabama driver's license is the credential to let us know that you're who you say you are. Now, if they don't have a valid Alabama driver's license, they can also go to our website at Vote for Alabama. Okay. But, uh, in alabamavotes.gov. But if they don't have a valid Alabama driver's license, they need to fill out the paper form and submit it to the Board of Registrar's Office. Then they'll confirm receipt, they'll register you to vote, and then your polling site will be assigned and you'll be notified where you need to go on March the 3rd. And that whole process takes about how long? Well, if you do it electronically, it takes about three minutes. I registered somebody at the gas pump one day at Wise Lake. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, all right. And do you all still have that, uh, I know you did this a few years ago, that mobile registration van? Yes, or we do. We actually okay, so have that's... the unit here tonight. Actually. Okay, so that's here now. Absolutely. I did not know that. All right, so um, let's say that you are that new voter. You've, you've got your registration. How do you know where your registration place is? Well, if you have been able to download the mobile app or if you have access to the computer, then you can, if the download the mobile app is 
vote for Alabama, mm -hmm. and the mobiles and the site on the computer is alabamavotes.gov. If you put your key information in, it'll tell you where your polling site is. So that's a one-stop shop. You, Absolutely. You, you can register. You know where your voting place is. Absolutely. All of that. Okay, And great. you can see who's on the ballot by looking at the sample ballot that we produced. See, I'll be honest. It's been so long since I registered, I forgot how to do all that. Right. That's one of the reasons I wanted for the viewers. And that's okay. That's why I'm here. That's right. Um, so uh, you said something about having register uh, voter registration, but if I'm not mistaken, under your tenure, we've also had record-breaking voter turnout we as well. We have every election that we have had. We anticipate that happening again on March the 3rd in a primary, and we anticipate it again November the 3rd, 2020. So we're excited mm -hmm. about where we're going and what's going on. Now, I don't think this is going to be as big an issue in this next election because it's a presidential election, and as you and I both know, that tends to help turn out quite a bit. Yes, it does. Um, but, you know, there are an awful lot of people that, that kind of look the other way on that, especially with special elections and that kind of thing. Um, what would you say to the average voter to, to help them understand how important it is to look at things down ballot, not just look at the presidency, um, in, in the way that those elections really affect them and their lives Well, and, and then the primary vote, I think it's very important to remember that not only are you selecting the president for both parties, right, and, of course, you have to choose a Democrat or a Republican ballot. You're voting for the people who will actually be voting for the president at the national conventions. That's the last thing on the ballot, those delegates that are trying to run to be representative of those candidates that you select. The other thing that's important to remember is that we have judicial races. We have several races for the Supreme Court. There's two races. We have two races on the Court of Criminal Appeals. We have two races for the Court of Civil Appeals, mm -hmm. where people are currently on the ballot. We have several local races, superintendent races, school board races, county commission races that are up, and many of those will be decided in the primary because those people are not opposed in November. So we want to encourage people to come out and vote, vote for their candidates, but check out the ballots on both sides before they turn their ballot in. So speaking of that, I do have one last question for you. Um, there are a lot of people, and, and I you know, am open to some of the debates and, and some of the arguments on both sides of this, that say that they don't like the fact that you have to pick Republican Democrat in the state of Alabama. And, and there's, you know, some people suggest that we go to a closed primary, you have to actually be a registered member of the party, some states do that. Uh, and then other people are saying we go in the opposite direction. We just have one ballot. You can vote for whoever you want, Republican or Democrat. Could you real quick sort of discuss some of the advantages and disadvantages Sure. Of Our that? parties have selected the primary opportunity as the way to select their nominees, which right. means that when you go to the polls, you have to say, okay, this cycle I'm a Democrat, or this cycle I'm a Republican, mm -hmm. which means you vote in the primary, then you vote in the runoff. In the general election, you can vote for any candidate that you choose, or you can write in the candidate of your choice. Right. But you can't vote for the Democrat and the Republican that you hope to beat in the fall. That's not acceptable. Because in that effect, we do have closed primaries because you have to stay with the party of your choice after you select that person, that party in the primary. Yeah, because you could have somebody, for instance, like let's say that, you know, I really want Trump to win, so I'm going to vote for Trump for the Republican because, of course, he's, you know, basically unopposed at this point. And then I go in and I'm like, you know what, I think it'd be really easy for Trump to beat Elizabeth Warren, so I'm going to strategically correct. vote. And, and so you could see how people could rig the system that way. That's correct. Right. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Thank Secretary. Thank you, my friend. Great to be with you always. Yeah. Thank you. And we'll, we'll have to get together and do a long-form interview a little bit later, I'll get more in-depth in some of this. And in studio with you again when we do that. Yeah, well, my studio's moved now. <laughs> oh, have you? Where are you now? Yeah, I'm over at Faulkner's campus. Okay. Okay, that's yeah. great. Well, when but, you get ready to have me, you let me know and I'll be there. Yes, sir, Mr. Secretary. You, always a pleasure. Good to see you. Secretary of State John Merrill, everybody, thank you for being with us. And welcome back, everybody, to Tactics. Thank you so much for being with us. We do have our second guest on. Um, this is uh, Lee Hill. Lee Hill. And you're running for the Revenue Commissioner. Yes, I am. So tell us a little bit about that, because uh, Revenue Commissioner is something that I'm sure that most people, they probably don't even know exactly what you do. So explain that to our audience for us. Um, well, in a nutshell, the, the Revenue Commissioner is the one that assesses property values and mm -hmm. sends out the tax bill and collects. Uh, the Revenue Commission Office is also responsible for the mapping of the county, 
Um, and, uh, and you know, well, in a nutshell, that's it. Uh, one of the other... Uh, so property values and property lines? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. For, uh, through throughout the, uh, for the county. Um, the, uh, the revenue commissioner's office is uh, responsible for more than half the uh, total revenue uh, generated for the uh, county government. Okay. So, you know, most of what we, we consider the, the, the county features are paid for through property taxes. Right. So, you know, the other line of, uh, the, of revenue comes in through, you know, driver's li- or I'm sorry, uh, tags, titles, licensing. Um, which uh, is, is a revenue stream that may be folded up into the Revenue Commissioner's office at uh, some point in the future. Could be. Um, so basically what, what you go to is infrastructure and then also property taxes are the main source of revenue for schools. Am I correct on that? Yes, they are. Okay. Yes, they are. So um, what do you plan to do as a Revenue Commissioner to sort of, I guess, expedite that process? Um, well, I can tell you uh, I, I, I've planned out what I would like to do for... Uh, the first 30, 90 days, um, if I if I'm elected. Okay. Um, I have a military background, uh, so I, everything that I'm I'm thinking is based off of the leadership that I learned in the military. All right. So the first 30 days uh, in office, I would sit with each individual in the op- in the commissioner's office, learning their jobs. Now I don't need to be fully proficient. I don't need to be able to do their job as well as they do, but I need to know what their job is. Leadership requires that someone know everything about the people below them. You, you can't effectively lead unless you know how everything, you know. It, I, I like, so, so your plan is to undercover boss everybody just without the secrecy? Not, 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 not undercover boss everybody, but it, it, it's like a, it's, it's a symphony. Okay, it, yeah. it, Leadership to me is, is, is a conductor. You need to know the notes of every instrument. So you need to know the, 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 the tasks and, and the skills of everybody below you to be able to bring that into a cohesive whole. Um, and then for 90 days, I want to do a bottom-up review of all the data uh, that's generated. Um, the, 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 the tax uh, records, the database that's maintained. Um, I, I understand that you know anything of this complex nature, there's going to be errors. Sure. But I think we can tighten up a lot of those errors. And I think we can, can clean up some of the data and I think people would appreciate being able to get their tax bill right the first time. Um, well, yeah, I'm sure everyone would appreciate that. No, no, nobody's happy when they get a, get a bill that just completely uh, unexpected, uh, doesn't have any sense of, of reality. And, and that's happened to people that I know. They, they've received a bill, uh, they've looked at it and said, this isn't right, I don't understand. They go back to the office and they're, oh, that was just a clerical error. Hmm. Something like that can be fixed, and, and I would work towards fixing that. So when it comes to property values, which you said is something that that office uh, takes care of, how would that affect somebody that is looking to, to buy or sell a home? Like, the, d- does what the government do have anything to, does that have any effect on the price, or how does that work? Well, to be honest with you, uh, I don't know how much that would influence somebody's decision. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know that you know, when we purchased a house, uh, we had to you know, put tax money into an escrow. Sure. We do a we, we do an annual um, payment uh, to the county. Now I do know that you know our tax our our, our revenue. Ta- uh, I'm sorry, our property taxes are extremely low compared to other parts of the country, and, right. and that that I really appreciate. I, I hear what my my friends out on the west coast they have to pay for their property, and it, it's outrageous. It's more than my mortgage. Yeah. So I. I don't think that property taxes really have a huge influence on whether or not somebody's going to buy a house in Elmore County because our tax rates are, are low enough to, to make moving here very attractive. So, in other words, it would be something that might affect their decision to move uh, to, to Elmore County or California, but as far as like Elmore County versus Otago or Montgomery, probably not that big a difference. I, I, I can't see that being much of a difference, no. Okay. Now, now, I personally, I would recommend moving to Elmore County. <laughs> I've driven I'm sure you would. <laughs> I've driven through Montgomery, so. Right. So um, when it comes to that, uh, do, do you have to do any work? Would your office have to do any work with any of the surrounding counties? Like, is there any collaboration that has to go on there? Oh, absolutely. I would be relying on, on the neighboring counties uh, just to get spun up. Um, I, I'm a big believer in copy from the best, mm-hmm. learn from the best. And uh, I'm not ashamed to say when I don't know something, I don't know it. And I will go find out. Okay. Well, 
when it comes to the average citizen that is, you know, because let's be honest, when it comes to uh, politics, the average citizen, they might check in maybe two weeks before an election, and by the time they've uh, entered, or by the time they started researching some of the top ticket people, president, senator, revenue commissioner probably doesn't come up on their radar much. So what would you say to the average voter to help explain to them the importance of this office and who holds it? Uh, the, the, the best uh, reason and justification I can think of is a um, very famous politician whose name eludes me now said that, you know, with taxes I buy civilization. I think that, you know, although we do have to, you know, pay taxes, nobody wants to, the, the, the best thing that we can do is make sure that it's done fairly, consistently, and with the least amount of errors possible. Uh, I, I, I pledge I will do this position with transparency and precision. And transparency isn't just throw everything out where everybody can see it, it's explain it. I, I want to set up a, 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 the ability to learn how these, you know, how, how property assessments are done. Okay. Because quite honestly, it, it's almost a mystery. Uh, a lot of people don't understand what the difference is between my, my, my neighbor's assessment and my property value. I would like to see some kind of mechanism, and I'm a big believer in, you know, put something on the internet. I would like to see an app. We live in a world of cell phones. Nobody right. has, everybody has a cell phone. Uh, there should be an app that someone can use. Uh, to me, that, that is the hallmark of transparency. Not only just seeing the information, but being able to understand it. Well, when it comes to that, and you know, it's interesting that you bring up the technology aspect of it because, ironically, an awful lot of people pay their taxes also through those apps. Um, when it comes to that, are, the, are there any red flags or anything people, anything that people need to look out for if they're using one of these uh, applications or the software when it comes to their individual property taxes here in the state? Well, I, I, I can't. The, you know, I, I am. I know that's very specific. I, I will admit, I am not the the, the most uh, expert guy with computers. Right. Uh, but I, I do know that the database that's currently being used uh, for the online uh, property lookup uh, it, it has some errors to it. Uh, my own house does not exist. If I if if I was to look it up, that's fascinating. It, it, so you're living off the grid. I am living off the grid. I do get a, I do get a bill, so I know somebody's tracking it. Yeah. But you know, if I use the online tool, my house doesn't show up. So that that should be a lesson to all of you. Even if your house doesn't exist, they'll still charge you for it. They will. They will find you. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Hill. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. I and, enjoy uh, this. this good, is... Yeah. Good luck in the upcoming election. Is there anything else? If somebody did want to support your campaign, they wanted to uh, get more information about you, where would they go to do that? Uh, I have a website. It is hillforrevenuecommissioner.com. Hill, the number four, revenuecommissioner.com. Uh, see, I appreciate you adding the number because I would have put F-O-R. <laughs> All right. Well, you have a good evening. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, sir. And we'll see you around. I will. All right. That's Lee Hill. He's running for Revenue Commissioner. We'll be back in just a second. Welcome back, everybody. We're here at the Wetumpka Tea Party Candidates Forum, and we are here with a candidate for District 2. Not I'm District sorry. 2? Okay. Just yes, making sure. Yes, I've had so many people come in. Oh, I, I understand completely. This has been a busy night. Barry Moore is here with us. Right. So. Um, you actually have run for this position in the past. I did. I did. Actually, and I ran last time around, uh, 2016. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I endorsed President Trump. At the time, he was a candidate, actually. Right. Um, he got sworn in, and then when Martha Roby pulled her support, um, he asked me to run at that point. His team did. And so we stepped up and ran. I guess an incumbent with a pile of money. But we felt like we needed to send a message that our, our Republican Party owes it to our Republican president to stand with it. And so uh, we ran and uh, made a heck of a show, and we got 20% 20, 20 of the vote and spent about 5% of the money. So, yeah. so when she said she wasn't running this time, naturally my phone started ringing because a lot of my conservative buddies, a lot of my Trump friends are like, man, you term limited yourself in the Alabama House. You could go service in D.C. if you're willing to go. And so right. put it through a lot of prayer, a lot of thought, and uh, here we are in another doggone political race. Well, uh, <laughs> I don't even like this stuff, and here I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, i got to tell you, I fought that uphill battle against Martha Roby myself. Oh, I mean, not as me as a candidate, but man, that is that is heavy working lift, against the, yeah. the tide for sure. Yeah, when you figure they got a couple million dollars in K Street money and special interest money, the establishments behind them. I mean, 
it's uh, short of a miracle Donald Trump wouldn't even be president right now. And so, hey, it, but but Martha Roby told me she's Trump's best friend, and whenever uh, Trump needs something, he calls Martha Roby to get it done. That's yeah. what the ad said. Well, I, that's I've never heard that. Oh, you didn't see that? You ad? Must be in the loop. Dude. No, no, she had a thirty-second oh, ad. ad. Okay, yeah, she I had a you. yeah. Roby had a thirty-second ad. And in this ad, she claimed that whenever Donald Trump needed his agenda through, he calls oh, Martha Roby. Was not aware, you know. Yeah. You can pay people to say about anything. Nowadays, oh, it, it was you know? a voice actor. Yeah. I, know, I actually know who it is. Oh, I got you. Yes, sir. So, it, yeah, I didn't realize that. Uh, but I tell everybody, I actually do know the guy. You know, and, and, and we are pretty, uh, we are connected. So. Yeah, you were actually a very early Trump adopter, if I'm not mistaken. First in the nation. August 21st, 2015, he came to Mobile and... Uh, there were a bunch of elected officials there in the building. All wanted to meet the guy, and I was supposed mm. to meet with Scott Walker, the governor of Wisconsin, the next day. Right, he was also and, running. Uh, right. That's right. Yeah. And so, but we were just asked, "Would y'all be willing to endorse him?" And so, my wife and I went down the hallway of that bus. We said a quick prayer. We got a piece. We went out and became the first elected official in the nation to endorse Donald Trump. Uh, he had no I did chance to win. Not winning. know that. Yeah, yeah. First, August twenty first, two thousand fifteen, and we went out that day and endorsed him. And so. I ran and got elected as a Trump delegate as well. So I was the first to endorse him. I was with him four times in Alabama when he was running. I spoke for his bus tour and then a couple other different events. My daughter, Kathleen, was the youngest elected Trump delegate in the entire nation. She ran in Auburn, Alabama at age 18, won it, and then he won the nomination. So we had the first to endorse him in the nation and the youngest delegate, both from the Moore family. Huh. So it's, it's a small world sometimes. Well, you know, um, one of the things that I really wanted to dig down into uh, – when it comes to, I think that one of the, especially this week, uh, one of the things that is on the forefront of everybody's mind is we have a Democrat-controlled House, and we're seeing what Democrats have done in Virginia when they get all three branches, or I say three branches, Congress and yeah. the executive, yeah. in, the, in that case the governor. Yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, I don't know if they have the they may have the courts too. I have no idea. Probably. But uh, in Virginia, that has happened, and that's been a traditionally red state that has right. flipped blue. And so, I think a lot of people are legitimately concerned with things like the Second Amendment, like yes. uh, making it harder to impeach the governor, like sure. they did in Virginia. So, what would you, as a member of the House, try to do to curtail that or try to stop the Democrat control? Well, House? I think what we have to do, and, then, and I met with the Freedom Caucus the night before the impeachment started, out of 435 congressmen, you got about 20 men in that room that don't take a lot of special interest money, and they truly, I believe, have the president and the, the nation's best interest at heart. But, you know, I was thrilled to death all the citizens that showed up with the weapons yesterday. At, and it wasn't no violence, they cleaned up the mess. There wasn't no defecating on the streets. Those guys, those citizens, it's a miracle. those great Americans. <laughs> man, don't that say a lot about the conservative movement in the country. Now, yeah, there's some spillover from Virginia, Alexandria, into that area that's kind of taking some of those states blue. But the Freedom Caucus, I think, is the key. And the, the cool thing about that is when I went to D.C., I was worried because I'm a Trump delegate. I was a person in the nation endorsing. I was with him till the you know till he got elected, obviously. Right. I've been supporting him ever since. I was worried with the Freedom Caucus and him work together, but I was told they talked to de to, on the phone every day. So the Jim Jordans of the world, the Mark Meadows, they're the men who really, really are trying to represent the American people as oh, is the sure. president. As is the president. Mm -hmm. And so they may not agree on the budget. They may not, but I'm going to tell you what, overall they're patriots and they're fighting for our nation. And uh, that's what we've got to do. We've got to get more people who don't care about getting reelected, who don't care about the special interest money, and don't get sucked into the power and say, you know what? The American people or my district sent me here. We need to stand and stand on convictions. And that's what we've always done in the Alabama legislature. You know, I served two terms and I was labeled the most dependable conservative vote in the legislature. That's because I always voted my convictions. I never wavered. The lobbyists knew, hey, this guy's conservative. If it lines up with his values, he, you get him. If it don't, there's no need to stop him by his office. And that's how I governed. And so when I walked away from that after eight years, I mean, I, I served in the state well and thought I was honestly done with politics. Well, you know, speaking of that, and, and I know I, I, ha I feel like I have to ask this, um, even though I know the answer. Um, recently, one thing that came up is a old allegation that someone dug up from, what, four or five years ago? Yeah, 2014. Yeah, so um, if you could explain to the listener that, you know, they may have just kind of heard part of the story. Sure, sure. Um, if you could just kind of go in depth into what all happened oh, with sure. that. Oh, sure. Thank you. Because you weren't asking. cleared of all charges. Yeah, thank you for asking. Yeah, 
we found that when we went to Montgomery, there was a swamp. Now, nobody had ever dubbed a swamp. We didn't know what to call it. I mean, <laughs> Trump and we, nobody had ever, it was before Trump ran. So when we went into Montgomery, we immediately began to fight the special interest stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, I told Heather and my wife, I said, baby, we put a bullseye on our back. When you start standing against this kind of deep state kind of money that's going on and, and the, 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 I scratch your back, you scratch, when you start standing against that, you become a target. Right. Well, I became a target, just like General Flynn. They wanted me to roll over and cut a deal, and I wouldn't do it. So they set a trap for me, just like they did General Flynn. The difference in me and Flynn is he pled because they went after his son. Me, I said, no. I said, we're going to stand and fight this thing. We're going to take it all the way to a jury of our peers, and we're going to let them see the evidence, and then let them decide. But that stuff was leaked all the time. Did you ever notice? All that stuff was leaked on me to the media, mm. but the prosecutor right. was fired. And then he was escorted out of the building later after that case. And there's a book being written, and there's a chapter in there called The Ambush of Barry Moore. And what it was was a setup from the get-go to take me out of office. If I, they actually told me, oh, if you'll just, you know, if you won't run again, this is probably, you know, it's going to be all right. But I refused, man. I, I, the people elected me, and I felt like the Lord called us to run, and we didn't feel like we needed to bow out. We needed to fight. And that's what I've proven over that time is I will stand no matter how much pressure is applied for what I believe in and for what's right. General Flynn, those guys, it's the same thing we're seeing now is that the Department of Justice in D.C. is trying to take out conservative leaders, good people who, the, who, who have been elected by the electorate. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I was found not guilty, cleared on all charges and exonerated. And the prosecutor he was fired and uh, escorted from the building. So it was a setup well, from the get-go. Well, it was yeah. a perjury trap. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, and I hate it. I hate we've got to cut it short, it's but okay, I've got brother. people waiting. Anytime. But uh, thank you. Barry thank Moore, you, and you're running for District 2 of Alabama. That's if right. somebody does want to get in touch with you or help your campaign, how do they do that? Okay, two good ways. Uh, www.barrymoreforcongress.com okay. and then Barry Moore Republican for Congress on Facebook. I maxed out on my personal page, but Barry Moore Republican for Congress, good place to follow us. We keep, we keep everybody in the loop. All right, thanks thank so you, much. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. We'll you. see you later. All right, yeah, we, we've got our next guest coming over here. I've never done anything like this. This is all rapid fire, completely new to me, so it's a very different format. Uh, now we have Shanna Chamley. Shanna Chamley. Shanna Chamley. Yes. Now, um, you've never actually been on the program before. I haven't. Um, but but we, we've we met a couple times. It, I think the last time it was actually at a Tea Party event. Oh, I'm, I'm sure it was. I've been involved with the Wetupka Tea Party since 2014 and in leadership as the county commission watchdog leader and led the movement to get rid of the Limited Self-Governance Act and mm -hmm. get that repealed to save our property rights and I've worked on gun rights and... I was about to say, uh, the last time we spoke, I think it was about uh, legislation that you helped draw up when it came to gun rights? Yes, that would have been HB 47 in 2015. Right. I, I knew we had talked about it at some point. Yeah. Sorry. You, you know how it is that these things, you meet like 200 new people and you're trying to remember all <laughs> oh, of them. Oh, I understand. Look, I, I'm sitting here doing this interview right now with my husband telling me, oh, by the way, you, I set you up an interview on the radio. Yes, and, and he was very nice to help do that because yeah, uh, you were busy. But, but he knows if there's a microphone anywhere nearby, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad to have you on there. We appreciate you doing this. And uh, so what is it exactly are you doing here tonight? Because I know you're not running for office. No, I'm not. And Even I'm, though I would support you if you did. I have ran for office before, but no, I'm not doing that anymore. And I, I like this side of politics a little better. Okay. I, I work towards term limits on U.S. Congress. Mm -hmm. Now, that's something that's uh, kind of a buzzword, very popular in certain circles. Why do you think that it's so important right now? And, and it's for state and national level, the one that I, you're talking about, I, I work about, right? on the national level. Okay. And But it, I have to pass it through the state legislatures. We pass a resolution through the state legislatures, and we need to get to 34 states in order to have the, con the conversation. So is this a part of the Article 5 Convention of States? Um, yes, it is, an okay. it is an Article 5 Convention. All right. Now, we are not part of COS Project, which is an organization in and of itself, and they run a three-topic resolution. Our, now, we do work alongside them, and... I wholeheartedly believe in what they do too. I right. just believe that the single topic of term limits is the most palatable and has the ability to be able to pass 34 states in which I don't know that they're going to be able to get there anytime soon. And that's why I choose to work towards the, the single topic that's more so, palatable across the board. So for you, it's not an ideological difference, it's a pragmatic one. It, yes, it, it is definitely a pragmatic one in regards to which organization I choose to work for. But term limits itself, I, I mean, I, I'm sure you may know or have heard of, you know, I, I have a whole brood of children <laughs> and I, I have eight. And um, 
I have always had my children extremely civically involved. They have been dragged to the state house with me all of their lives. They have helped me be a citizen activist, lobbyist. They've worked on campaigns. And I've always talked to them about voting and having a choice. And I always take, I, I make a point to take them with me to the ballot box at every single election, special election, primary, general, everything. And even my kids noticed that we sit down with a ballot and there's names on there, especially when you get to higher offices, such as congressional offices, right. where there's one name on the ballot. Mm -hmm. And I told them they had a choice. Well, they don't, because the incumbency advantage is so large. We have a 95% incumbent re-election rate with an 11% approval rating in Congress. Mm -hmm. And they're able to use the franking privilege and outmatched a challenger in the district three to one on with money and sending out mailers and stuff on your dime, my dime. Oh yeah. And well, we, we just got through talking. I don't mean to interrupt, but we just got through talking to Barry Moore who ran against Martha Roby. Um, he was outspent like 30 to one. And when Becky Garrettson ran yes. against Martha Roby, she was outspent 13 to one. Yes. I, I worked on Becky Garrettson's campaign when she ran and I know how hard that was. And I, and being that I live in the district, right. I got three mailers a week from Martha Roby mm -hmm. that she was using my money to pay for while I sat in that office on Becky's campaign and had to help cherry pick addresses of which we could afford to send mm -hmm. one mailer to. And so when you have an open seat, you get a greater electable pool of candidates and real people in the district to choose from that have a passion to go and do something. And if they know we get term limits in place and then they know that they are going and it's not going to be a essentially lifetime seat right that they have a limited time to leave a legacy they're going to be more inclined to be answerable to the district they're going to have to go back and live in well and that's one thing that that i've said for a long time and this is going a little off topic with the way the internet is now i almost wish we had a rule that you have to live in your district <laughs> you just you know vote in on the internet and basically work from home. I think that that would be better in a lot of ways. The lobbyists wouldn't be so centrally located, but you know, that's just me. But I do think that term limits would have to, because then that doesn't create a class of people that don't have to live by their own rules. And that's what I think gets under a lot of people's skin. Right. Well, we poll at 82% across the board in the nation, and that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons to talk about the, the pragmatic aspect of that. It's the highest polling issue that is nonpartisan. Right. 89% Republicans, 76% Democrats, 83% Independents agree with wanting term limits. Those minuscule numbers on the other side of that that are the, the hard nose because there's some undecideds in that small other number as well. Sure. Those are the politicians and their families mm -hmm. and, and entrenched lobbyists. Well, now, <laughs> I have a question for you coming at it from the standpoint of a constitutionalist and a federalist. The, uh, the founders could have put term limits in place. They chose not to. So, I mean, why should we support this movement considering our founders had that option and just said no? Well, have it, considering yourself a Federalist, I mm -hmm. would... Um, and just and, so you know, I'm just playing devil's advocate Well, well I, I would implore you to read Federalist 85 by Hamilton. Mm -hmm. He spoke highly favorably of using this method of which he knew that we would one day need to bypass Congress to do something that they wouldn't do themselves. But at the time period... In, 1787 when they're writing the constitution in philadelphia right. they're not there wasn't an entrenchment of lifelong politicians at that point and they were going back home to live in their districts and they were servants and it wasn't something that was as highly needed it was discussed at the convention mm -hmm. at, yeah. so i mean it it was not entirely put into place there but we were given the mechanism of which to change i mean just like women's suffrage wasn't put in there either right and you know we've gotten 17 amendments outside of the bill of rights that have all been put in there since then that right. they didn't include to begin with so they always gave us a mechanism for change as it was needed so what is it specifically about term limits that you think would would help with the, the things that people complain the most about washington Oh, thank you, dear. <laughs> My nine-year-old. Yes. It's always <laughs> um, good to have assistance. <laughs> um, well, I definitely believe that it would open them up to being more answerable to their constituency. They would be closer to the people and not as long, and not so ingrained and entrenched. And they mm -hmm. would be more, I, 
it, it would just it would open the doors to people that got in there with that fiery passion and before it had burned out somebody else with that same fiery passion would be replaced because they become stagnant they become complacent and stagnant and allow a bureaucracy and lobbyists to take control and do things for them and and they become rich they become millionaires they don't they become elitists and they're no longer there for the intention that they went for and I, I believe that that would change the status quo you know and that's one thing that I really do think is unfortunate that there's an old saying that nobody comes out of Washington better than they were when they went in and it, unfortunately it's true and I think that that's one of the reasons that term limits is so important because I mean look at and I'm gonna throw some shade here you don't have to agree with me or not but like look at Senator Shelby Senator Shelby's done some good things for Alabama. I don't deny that. But the man's been in office since before I was born. <laughs> Do you know I use that a lot whenever I talk? Because one of the biggest arguments that I get, always from politicians, it's never from voters, because I told you how we poll amongst voters. Right. But when I'm talking to politicians, trying to get them on board for this idea, mm -hmm. they, will al they always come out with, well, we have term limits. It's called elections. I'm like, well... In theory, yes, right. but my senator has been Richard Shelby my entire life, and I have gone to the ballot box and not had a choice. Yeah. So. You know, even John Adams ran against George Washington in the first election because he said there should at least be another option. Like, he knew Washington was going to win. Washington knew he was going to win. Right. But he said they should at least get a choice. Right. And I think that same sentiment is reflected in this movement. And, and, and I tell people a lot of times that it's like, oh, well, people, there, there's hardly ever an uncontested race in the Congress. So it's like, well, go look at the statistics. There are. And uh, many of the other ones that are contested, I call it the Town Otis Syndrome. That, yes, there may be one or two contestants in the race against the incumbent that have raised essentially zero dollars, have zero chance, and have done zero, has done almost nothing in campaigning, and they're the only person crazy enough in the district to think that they could put their ballot, their name on the ballot and beat the multi-million dollar funded mm -hmm. senator or congressman. And so you still don't really have a choice. Yeah, and that's the thing. If there is ever anything that is uniquely American, it's having a choice of our leaders. Now, we don't always make the right choice, <laughs> but the point is there needs to be a choice there. Well, I thank you so much for being here. I've got another candidate that's got to head down to Mobile, so I've got to take it to the next guy. But thank you so much, Shanna, for being with us. Thank you. Shanna Chamley. And uh, real quick before we go, if someone does want to help you or support your movement, where do they go to do that? Uh, Termlimits.com. Okay. Well, you can sign the petition on there, and if you are a candidate, we have pledges of support there that you can print out and sign, and we do some earned media and PR type things that go out for our candidates who sign a pledge. All right. Thank you so much, Shannon. Have thank a good you. night. Stanley Adair is here, and uh, you're running for the United States Senate, am I correct? Yes, sir. That's correct. All right. So um, in this race, it's getting pretty full. And oh, yes, uh, so, uh, Mr. Adair, if you could just give us kind of a background and, and distinguish yourself a little bit from the other candidates. Well, that's the whole point of me running. I'm, I, I consider myself the only outsider really running. Okay. Um, I'm a businessman, 41-year uh, veteran of business. I, it's like to tell people. Uh, I started out in the manufacturing business and own several businesses. But uh, I'm running to give the people a clear choice between career politicians and someone that's a businessman, much like you know the president today, we see what he's done with the country moving forward. Right. And uh, we only have uh, we only have those that have been in uh, some kind of career thing, and, and some of them have been bought out in every contract they ever had, you know, and sold us out. And so uh, the American people are tired of seeing the same folks go to Washington to represent us. You know, I've got an old saying, you know, if we keep continuing to do the same thing, we're going to continue to get the same results. So we need to send someone with new vision. And uh, I'm very much, uh, uh, I strongly support term limits. You know, okay. that, that uh, some of them support them, some of them don't, but um, the ones that support them in their race has already been there, you know, 20 years. So right. now they come out for term limits, you know. But I said, you know, that separates me because I started out from the very beginning. Before I've ever ran for any public office, I signed the term limit pledge, saying that, you know, two terms is enough for anyone. Uh, 12 years, uh, of course, I, I don't need to give you a lecture on the founding fathers, but. Sure. But uh, during the Constitution, when they signed the uh, Declaration of Independence, 
there were 56 great men that stood up and said, hey, and one of two things is going to happen if we sign this. Number one, if we sign this and we separate from England, we're going to have a long hardship of forging a country without the help of them. But number two, if we don't succeed and we lose this battle, you know, uh, we're going to be run out of town. We're going to be run out of the country. We, we most likely be hanged. Yeah. And I don't think we could find a congressman or a senator one that would sign any kind of declaration like that today. They go up there and they only concerned about themselves. Or they start out in politics and they just want to climb the ladder, climb the ladder, climb the ladder. Sure. You know, so if you're doing such a great job for Alabama, for example, stay where you're at and do a good job, you know. That's my motto, you know. And, and I entered this race to give the folks a, a clear distinction between me and the other candidates. I'm not a career politician, nor do I want to be. And I tell folks, you know, politics is a nasty word. And I said, you know, two things I don't trust, and that's government and politics, or politicians, you know. I think it's time that we really enforce term limits and put them in place. Okay. So other than term limits, uh, what other policy um, positions do you hold on, you know, because in the Senate, I know that one of the biggest things is going to be judgeships. Yes, sir. So you seem to be somebody that's kind of a fan of the, the Founding Fathers, which, you know, you and I would, of course, have in common. Um, it, it, what kind of judge would you be looking for? Are you looking for somebody that, that holds that more originalist point of view? Like, what, what are you looking for in a judge? Well, uh, you know, very much conservative. I, you know, I'm, I'm a conservative uh, Republican, but uh, I think that we need, I think we may get a change and under this president, maybe to get two more Supreme Court justices. And, and I'd like to see that, you know, yeah. if we could. I'm not I wishing anybody to move on or anything, but right, I, I, understand. I, I think that we need conservative, common sense judges that don't try to rewrite the law or try to write the law, but just interpret it and, and do the job of interpreting the law and not trying to add to or take away from it. Just just do a real good job of interpreting. And I believe if we can find some justices that'll that'll take those stance. I think we can further our country, you know. But uh, there's a lot of things I'd like to see done besides Supreme Court justices. I would like to see uh, a balanced budget amendment. You know, okay. no one is talking about the $23 trillion that we have indebted ourselves to. And uh, much like you and I, we can't run our household just, uh, you know, with quantitative easing all the time. And that's what right. they do. They just buy their own bonds back, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and put a big fancy name, quantitative easing on it. You know, uh, it's code for inflation is what it is. Yeah it's, yeah, it's a real good start to really get us in worse trouble, you know. But I believe that if we don't sit down and come together and propose a balanced budget amendment, that we're going to be continuing to face larger amounts of debts in our future. And that is a national security uh, interest to me. It's a oh, national sure. security crisis because, uh, you know, right now with this impeachment hearing going on, we know that our enemies are watching us and they know we're divided. They know we're so divided, we're polarized and so divided. We've got to come back to the table and begin to work for our future of our children, our grandchildren, and our country, and our state. You know, our state, back in previous years, has been known as one of the most corrupt politician places in the country. You know, our state is largely viewed as a corrupt state, you know. Oh, at, so, one, at one point in recent history, we had, um, whether you agreed with it or not, our Supreme Court uh, Chief oh, Justice, my our governor and the speaker of the house all being uh you know tried at one almost at one time oh that's correct and so so i say this stop sending the same people to washington and expecting a different results we're not going to get it and i've been saying this you know uh one of the guys said well i'm not part of the establishment one of the guys that's running for senate you know he says i'm not i'm not part of the establishment because i vote conservative and i said well you mean you're telling me that there's not the establishment that is grounded and settled in Republican values, conservative values. Just because you vote conservative don't mean you're not part of the establishment. He was trying to uh, separate himself from the establishment, sure. but this gentleman is an establishment. And he wants his old job back, so you, that'll probably tell you who I'm talking about. I had a feeling you were talking about. Yes, yeah. he wants his old sessions. He wants his old job back. Right. And he feels that he's entitled to this job. And I just beg to differ with him. I believe, and I'm not alone, that a lot of folks believe in the state of Alabama here that we're going through this impeachment trial because he recused himself and now he wants to come back. Fight when the fight comes, stand and fight. Don't 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 turn down and take a second seat. Fight. Stand and fight for what you believe, you know. Well now, whether or not Senator Sessions and I haven't decided who I'm voting for in that race or not yet, 
whether or not Senator Sessions would have done that, he would have been in violation of two different federal laws yes, that he right. not recused. Well, that's true, but but I'm saying he could have he could have he could have stayed and filed anyway. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and I know he had to recuse himself, but just to me, it's just this this thing where you 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 go there and you when the fight comes, you turn and run. You know, I, I just don't like seeing that. Okay. And uh, so I, I'm very much, a, you know, one of the other guys that's running. I'm not trying to hit none of the guys that's running tonight, but one of the other guys that's running has been bought out at every contract he's ever had. You know, he's sold out and left early and things like that, you know. Mm -hmm. So we need people that will stay, stand, and fight for what this country is all about. Listen, our veterans go and fight for us, and they don't come home and complain. I, I, you know, some of, them, some of them come home without their limbs, you know. We owe right. them a big gratitude. Uh, to, we owe them everything we can give them. So that's why I'm 100% for supporting our veterans from the time they come home till the time they go. You know, since you brought that up, of course, one of the duties that you would have to oversee, and unfortunately this may become a reality in the near future, um, is that only Congress can declare war. That's exactly right. What line would Iran or any other country have to cross before you would consider voting in favor of that? Well, I, I tell you, uh, if they... If they like like Trump said here well back, if you take out one of ours, then that's a that's a red line. When you when you begin to hurt our citizens, because we are there to protect our citizens also, you know. Sure. So if they hurt our citizens, they hurt our army military bases or anything like that, uh, then uh, especially if they begin to kill uh, United States citizens, then that's right, an but, act to go to war. Right. But that's that's Trump's red line for taking action like he did with killing of Soleimani. So what I was wondering is specifically um, what would have to happen for Congress to declare war, in your opinion? What, what would make you vote for a well, full-on declaration? It would have to be more than just, you know, uh, uh, a few rockets lobbed at us. You know, we got to really okay. think about it before we go to war. I don't want to send my, my children to war uh, or, or the rest of Alabama's children to war, you know. Right. I want to make sure that it's something other that, that entitles us to go to war. You know, I wouldn't just at the stroke of a pen, you know, say, hey, let's go to war. I had a congressman the other day said uh, he was on a battleship, mm -hmm. and he said when he saw those guys take their helmets off and, and he looked at him, he said, man, it was 21 years old, and he said, I sure wouldn't want to send my 20. He said, I wouldn't in no way send yeah, my 21. Yeah, makes you think. I said, well, yeah. I said, but uh, we got to be careful about that because, you know, yes, when we send our people to war, it's got to be over something more than just a few uh, stones thrown at us. You see what I'm saying? Sure. It needs to be something that we have to declare. And we do need the body of the Congress. And, you know, I, I'm for that. You know, I'm for not just, you know, giving somebody the hand. Let's go to war. Right. You know, it's just too much. That's too much power for anybody, you know. So we need to have a, a, a bipartisan agreement. Hey, we need to do something about this, you know. So that's why it's all right, so I'll ask you this one last question because I know you got to go. Um, when it comes to the budget, you talked an awful lot about getting this debt under control, and and I, you know, 100% agree with you. Yes, sir. So my question is, what specifically do you think needs cutting? What are some of the items that you think we could cut back on in the federal budget? Well, you know, uh, Alabama relies on a lot of federal money. You yeah. know, we know that through the you know the rocket space and the army and. Navy, we, we rely on a lot of federal money. We do. Uh, discretionary spending is, is what the, the budget's in. But we need to cut out programs that we are layering programs on top of each other. We have some bloated programs that we could cut back. Number one thing I would like to see cut back on is giving our uh, our enemies money. You know, we, we supplied so Iran. So foreign aid. Well, not just necessarily. I'd like to cut some foreign aid. I, I don't say cut it all because we need to help those that help us. But this sending money to people that are enemies trying to bomb, we need to stop some of that. Because the $153 billion that we sent to Iran, right. I believe some of that came back in rockets here a while back. So, you know, so right. Obama, Obama really done this country, in my opinion, a very much a disservice when he sent all this money to Iran. You know, withhold some of this stuff that, that are just... Uh, uh, they using it back on us, you know. So we need to we need to cut some of those programs for sure, you know. And uh, we need to work on strengthening our infrastructure. We need to work on. I, I still I'm a strong believer in in being able to buy insurance across state lines for our healthcare people. You know, we need to okay. lower prescription drug prices. I mean, this stuff is out of whack. 
I mean, you know, some folks cannot afford to go uh, go get all the medicines they need, and we have a we have a problem with rural health and and, and rural communities throughout Alabama. We need to make sure that we get the uh, you know doctors don't want to go and settle in a rural community because there's not enough funds there. Right. And we got a lot of bureaucracy laid up on top of you know reimbursements for Medicare and stuff. So we need to work on trying to trim that down where it's not such a big problem to, to get the payments back to the people that are providing the services and because that would help the rural communities with health care. Sure. So we need to work on some things like that to bring them back in line because me and you could buy and sell something at the drop of a hat. You know, you can give me something, I can render you some money and that's called capitalism. Right. But when it gets into the medical field and the health care, one little thing can hold up that payment from that, that uh, hospital and then it creates mm -hmm. a backlog of things. So we need to get some of those things cut out and streamline that a little bit better. And we can if we put our heads together. And we can help lower drug prescription prices for the elderly and seniors because those are big parts of their income. You know, Maybe they're on a fixed income, okay. but then, then they have to buy a secondary insurance in order to take care of their medicines. So it's just, you know, it's dollaring them to death. So we need to work on streamlining some of that. All right, so uh, Mr. Adair, if somebody heard you they, they like what they hear. They want to support your program. How do they do that? Where would they go? You can go to www.stanleyadairforsenate.com or www.stanleyadair.com. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Instagram. Uh, we are an open candidate, so what okay. that, and our campaign is open. You can view it. You can see where we're going. We post things online all the time, and we very much encourage people. I want to say this. I appreciate what you're doing to inform the candidates because... Well, thank you. I believe it, that vetting the candidates is one of the most important parts of this process. Knowing who you're voting for. Don't just vote because they have a name, but vote because of what they stand for and their values. My dad was a carpenter, my mom was a nurse, and I know what hard work's like, and I know what it's like. I know what the people of Alabama are talking about. They want to better themselves and better their family. That's all they're looking for. People in Alabama wants to be protected, better their better themselves, and give their children better than what they have. And they don't want bureaucracy taking it from them. And when you say laws to me or you say regulations to me, you say freedom. You say they want to take a little bit more of our freedom. So I don't want that. Okay. I'm for less government, less regulation, less taxes, and let's get some of this bureaucracy out of the way so our country can continue to experience this growth that we're seeing. All right. Well, thank you much. Man, Stanley I appreciate Adair. you having me out. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, good luck in the campaign. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Have a good one. That's Stanley Adair. He's running for Senate in this great state of Alabama. Hey, how are you doing? How are you? I'm great. How are you? So this is completely impromptu. Okay, yes. Because <laughs> uh, I think we have met before. Yes. Um, are, are you running for uh, office this time? I am. I'm running for Martha Roby seat for Congress for Congressional District 2. Okay. Well, it's great to see you again. Um, Terry Hassel Hasdorf. 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 Okay. Yes. I'm sorry. I've I've done like six interviews no, in the it's world. Okay. So, it's okay. so my my brain's a little you know <laughs> uh, it's basically pudding at this point. Sure. All right. So you're running for Martha Roby's old seat. I am. Well, um, I gotta say, you know. I think that a lot of people are running for that seat because Martha Roby sort of bowed out, which I wasn't expecting, and um, th that pool is getting kind of crowded. Yeah. So uh, if you could really quickly just kind of explain some of the differences in you and some of your opponents and try to distinguish yourself a little bit. Sure, absolutely. Well, you know, I uh, really feel called to do this. This is something for me that... Um, I prayed about and I really felt like it was something that God was calling me to do. I am a Christian conservative. Um, the way I got into politics was um, I, when I was in high school, I was asked by Governor Hunt to go on an exchange program to Russia. Okay. And I traveled to the Soviet Union and I, I saw firsthand what communism and socialism looked like. We traveled to seven different cities, it was 40 different high school students from across the state. And when I came back and the plane landed at JFK, I was so thankful to be an American that I literally got down on my hands and knees and kissed the ground. <laughs> and it, it really made an impact on me as a young mm. person. And um, you know, when I think about what's happening right now where we've had this rise in socialism here in the United States, where people are actually considering the, electing a president presidential candidate who is in favor of that. I'm horrified. Multiple because, right now. Yes, yeah. yes, because I've seen this firsthand. And mm -hmm. I can tell you that I am very passionate about that issue. 
um, I think that we need to uh, rise up and fight back hard because that is the absolute opposite of everything that makes America great. The thing that um, we are battling right now is basically what the left wants to push on us is substituting government for God. And, you know, yeah. I'm in favor of God That's something I say on my show all the time, yeah. Well, that's, that's really what has driven me to want to run. Um, mm. You know, it, this is a, um, a serious time that we live in right now in our country. And um, we need people that are going to fight for God over government. Well, you know, I'm really glad to hear that because I think that's, you know, arguably one of the best motivations anybody could have is that they, they feel that, you know, they have to preserve that. And, and that's something that, that God has sort of called them to do. So what I want to ask with that is um, in the House right now, mm -hmm. it's controlled by the Democrats, mm -hmm. probably will be controlled by the Democrats, even if you're elected. I right. mean, that's not something that's that's likely to change. So uh, if you were elected, mm -hmm. how do you manage being in the opposition party? Like, what, what good does that do? Try, try to explain to the voter why having you in the House would be uh, something that's beneficial for them, even though it might be controlled by the other side. Well, the first thing that I would look at doing, uh, I've already met with Congressman Mark Meadows. Um, I'm excited about being a part of the Freedom Caucus. The House Freedom Caucus is, you know, a group of conservative members of Congress. We need right. more conservatives to come in and join that fight and be mm -hmm. able to push back against some of these things. Um, you know, I'm a conservative. I'm a woman who uh, has faith and values and integrity, and those are things that I think we need more of in Congress. And um, you know, this this fight is a spiritual battle as well as a, a sure. physical battle. So we um, need a lot of people to uh, people of faith to join in and really push back on a lot of this liberal left agenda that's that's coming down the pike. And that's what I'm prepared to go in and do. Well, now, when it comes to that, I know that with the House specifically, everything that the federal government spends money on starts in the House. That's mm -hmm. part of the Constitution. That's right. So when it comes to our spending levels, where do you think we should, since you said you're a conservative, mm -hmm. um, what are some of the programs you think that we can cut? Maybe we can trim some here or there, remove completely. Like, right. where do you stand on some of those? So I'm a fiscal conservative. Okay. Uh, my first job on Capitol Hill was working under Speaker Gingrich. And uh, Newt Gingrich brought my boss and I in to bring reforms that were business-minded reforms to the operations of the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. So I've had people tell me, you know, be careful about telling people that you worked in Washington because they're going to think you're part of the swamp. <laughs> well, my response to that is not only am I not part of the swamp, I helped drain one. Mm -hmm. So when I worked for the CAO's office, the first thing that we did was we conducted an independent audit on the operations of the House of Representatives. Okay. Um, it was we hired Price Waterhouse Cooper to come in and do that audit. Right. They uh, worked with us on coming up with ways to cut out the waste, fraud, and abuse that was happening there. And the reforms that we were able to put in place since those happened um, have saved the taxpayers over $4.4 billion. So I have a little experience with draining swamps. Sure. I'm excited about being able to join President Trump in draining some more. And I think um, that those same business-minded reforms, this isn't rocket science. It's very simple when you know what to do and how to start putting things in place to do it. That needs to be applied to every level of government, starting with you know the agencies on down. So that's sure. what I want to go in and do. Now, when it comes to the House, one of the most important things that any representative can have is their committee appointments. Right. So what I really want to know and sort of dig down into is I know that you don't always have control over that because that's something that's that's set by other people and, and you kind of have to get what you can, you have to take what you can get really. But uh, if what would your areas of expertise be? What would the committees you would try to get on to? Sure. Um, I think my first priority, obviously, would be armed services. We have Maxwell Air Force Base and Fort Rucker. I'm so proud of the men and women that serve. Uh, I would want to go and fight for resources and, and um, definitely be there to um, push for the peace through strength agenda and okay. see what we could do um, on that front. And then the Agriculture Committee would probably be my second choice. We have some incredible farmers in this district. Um, I mean, look, we, we are very blessed here. We have the people that feed us and the people that protect us as two of the main people that are part of this, that make that's, up this district. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, yeah. And you know, they need to have somebody fight for them the way they fight for us. I mean, right. both of them are doing incredibly vital roles mm -hmm. and they need to be supported. So that's what I would want to go and do. Well, you know, uh, when it comes to that, and I know that I'm wading into uh, contradictory waters here, <laughs> um, but since you are a fiscal conservative, I'm, I'm interested to hear your stance on this. There are an awful lot of farmers in Alabama, and they are big fans, a lot of them, of farm subsidies. Mm -hmm. So where do, you, where do you stand on farm subsidies in general? Well, I know we... Um 
we have uh, our peanut farmers in particular who um, feel like they've been um, not able to move forward in recent years with even being increasing able to increase their prices right um, and they're very frustrated over that I think somebody needs to fight for them and push for that that's that's only fair um, I think that subsidies in general are something that um, you know probably there could be uh, some areas where um, I would need to I would need to study that a little bit more but probably there could be some areas where there could be some reform there okay well, I know that that's a, a tricky question because mm -hmm. you, you don't want to get everybody, because the second that you say, well, let's look into it, they're like, oh, no, they're going to take away. Right, right, right. And, you know, I, I do think that there is, um, uh, when it comes to that, that there's definitely, just like in any other place in government, there's room to make some cuts. Right. Uh, but since, you know, especially District 2 is such a, a farm-heavy district, um, is there any other kind of deregulation? Because I know you mentioned price controls being one thing that you'd want to look at. Is there any other regulation that you would want to cut back that would help not just farmers but other working class families in, in District 2? Um, I think that uh, when you talk about deregulation, one of the areas that um, is, is a particular concern with mm -hmm. this district is you know anything that's regarding the military, uh, anything that's regarding um, spending cuts to military families and, and bases um, definitely would want to make sure that we're protective of that I think sure. that um, looking at one of the one of the main areas that I'm concerned about you have uh, rural areas that are not getting enough as far as health care as far as needs met so those are those are two of my biggest priorities right now is looking at what we could do to address that with um, more doctors yeah. more clinics healthcare in in the rural areas in particular. So, so how do you balance that? Because I know that that's very tricky because you're you're trying to make sure that as a fiscal conservative, you're not just like coming up with a government program that's going to spend a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So so how do you do, what, what are some of the policies that you would push forward that try to help solve those problems without putting the taxpayer even further in debt than we already are? Sure. So um, one of the things that I'm really great at and that I've done a lot in my career is bringing together people and resources uh, from several different areas to meet needs and so okay. you know we don't leverage the sectors very well everybody works in silos so looking at how the nonprofit and the for-profit and the government sectors can start working together to meet some of these needs is critical um, so let's take the rural health care for example um, there's nonprofits that are focused on that that um, need to be given more grant and funding I would push for that and fight for those opportunities for them Alabama okay. typically um, has a lot of opportunity to pull down more grants than, than we take advantage of. And that's something that, as a member of Congress, you can write letters of support, you can advocate with agencies to be able to pull more of that down. So I would look at pushing for that. Second of all, um, there's you know ways that, I know UAB in particular is particularly focused on wanting to do more with rural health care and telemedicine, and mm -hmm. we need uh, IT infrastructure to be able to support that. So getting uh, rural broadband into some of these areas is going to be critical. Um, looking at how uh, we can pull down funding, there's opportunity zone funding for that, there's other areas where we can leverage. It's a holistic approach and you need all actors engaged to address some of these concerns and that's what I want to pull together once I'm elected to Congress. Okay, so um, one of the things that always I, I sort of look for in a candidate is uh, where their base comes from. And I know you already got into that a little bit uh, and, and sort of what drives you, uh, talking about not only your kids but your faith. Um, but when it comes to some of these policy issues, like how did you come to be where you are as, as a conservative? Was it just the trip to Russia? Was that just sort of the genesis of it? Or like, is this something you've always been into? No, I think for me, I mean, obviously my faith drives everything that I do. Sure. And it, it's the worldview that I look through. It's that lens that I, that I measure everything against. But, you know, um, as somebody who has really looked at a lot of the issues and studied things from just working with them over the years, um, that the conservative viewpoint is something that just you know not only is is biblically sound but um, it makes the most sense when you start looking at the economic impact and just the way that uh, our country is needing to be protected in a lot of ways from sure. from liberal agenda so you, you do know, though, that it's democratic socialism. It'll be completely different Absolutely. than all the other socialisms that we've tried. 
Oh. Socialism is socialism. Uh, you know, the, the promises are always there. It's never worked. It's always failed. There's never been a time in history when it's worked. Well, I mean, that's, uh, I mean, it's just a fact. You can't really argue that. Um, even the ones that push for it right. have to admit that pretty much every time it's ever been tried, and then they'll, they'll try to deny, well, that wasn't real socialism. But either way, um, at a certain point, you have to say scoreboard and, say, and, and take a look at it. But, um, you know, there are a lot of forces, and I, I would say even ones that have gained more traction in the House of Representatives, pro-socialism. How do you combat that? Because there are a lot of people that, that are in favor of it. They, they want to give these people a platform. And, and like we were talking about at the beginning of your interview, we've got two major candidates for the president right now. Mm -hmm. I would argue that some of them are and just won't admit it. Right. But that are in favor of socialism. What's the best argument against socialism in your opinion? Oh, my goodness. Well, first of all, you know, people of faith need to understand what that means and I think that people who are not familiar with what socialism really looks like right. needs to start studying what some of these countries that have adopted socialism have, have become. I mean, look at Venezuela. Look at right. look at Russia. When when I was in Russia, um, you know, you didn't have a menu that would be given to you. You got one choice. You'd walk into the restaurant, and that was all you got. And, um, and Russia milk picks you. Right, right, right. You don't you don't have 15 different types of milk to choose from. You're right. lucky if you can get any milk, and you have to stand in line for four or five hours to hope to get it. That's what socialism looks like. Mm. Socialism is about um, taking away freedom and and. Basically, it's, it's replacing God with government. And we need people of faith to stand up against that. We need people who are willing to fight and push back. And that's what I'm prepared to do. All right. Well, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, Terry Hasdorf? Hasdorf. Okay, I'm always, I'm sorry. I'm terrible with names, and so I'm self-conscious about that's it. Even okay. when I say it right, I feel like I'm saying it wrong. And uh, she's running for District 2, Martha Roby's old seat. Yes. And uh, we wish you the best of luck. Thank Thanks you for so being much. with us. It's an honor to be with you. If somebody was interested in your campaign and wanted to support you, Absolutely. how would they do that? TerryForCongress.com. T-E-R-R-I for Congress.com. TerryForCongress.com. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Take care. Have a good night. You too. All right. Well, it looks like everybody's kind of filtering out. So what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to wrap up. Thanks so much for being with us. We hope that uh, you've enjoyed the program, and hopefully this has been something that's been informative to you. I know it certainly was to me. Didn't get to get every candidate in here, but hopefully we've been able to get enough of you. Uh, we thank also the Wetumpka Tea Party for hosting this event that has helped us immensely on making some of these decisions. If you want to get in touch with them, they have a website, WetumpkaTeaParty.com, I believe is the website, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, we appreciate you being here with the program. In the meantime, stay the course, friends. Tactics is a production of News Radio 1440 and Cumulus Media Montgomery. Opinions expressed on this program are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Cumulus Media or our business partners. Graphics by Jessica Dawson. Video production by Jackson Dean. Broadcast studio provided by Faulkner University. Location studio provided by the Dalreda Church of Christ. Copyright 2020.